Hi, welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case. Today is an update from Dylan's mother, where things are at with the investigations, and also to do with the news channel because of the interviewer asking, I guess, popular questions about suspicion of certain stuff, farmland, Dylan's behaviour, the mother's, etc., and the mother responding to all that. So I made a few notes, okay, so bear with me. Start things off with the interview. It was just Dylan's mother there. The father wasn't this time round. Same presenter as last time. You know, the way he talks himself to presenter and the way he asks questions is quite good and it's clear to follow, which is useful. The length of the videos too from that news channel aren't too long, so it's not too cluttering. Does that make sense? Yeah. So one of the first points mentioned or talked about was the investigation itself, like where are we at? And the mother replied saying about, well, police are working on it, despite the mess beforehand, the way things went, police are making progress, like there are things happening, there are things they know of, but can't be released to the general public yet. Now, it depends how you interpret that. The way I see it is, well, they must have found something to keep it a secret. And if it's a secret, it must be important. And I guess it can't be revealed yet because if it was, maybe it would lose the credibility or it might be for certain legal reasons, something to do with privacy. You know what I'm saying? Could be numerous reasons to what. You can let me know in the chat what you think about it, about the police themselves. Are they being too secretive? Are they just simply doing their job following the procedure? And what do you think was found? More items of Dylan, his remains, or something else? So it's just worth taking into mind about that sort of stuff. Now, the next point mentioned was the interviewer asked Dylan's mother about the suspects, who were the main ones. And it's, it tends to be the number two, two main people being talked about, Chase and Jim. Now, you've seen me talk about them two previously, in separate videos, Jim mainly being the main one because of his criminal background, his history, him owning guns, uh, being a felon, etc. And then with uh, Chase, because Chase was in the presence of Dylan before he disappeared and, you know, the way Chase was acting and the situation he was in coming out of the desert, supposedly covered in blood uh, with no shoes or with one shoe or something, he supposedly has guns as well. So it's like... They're the two main ones, but I still think there could be a third one. And like what I said in the last video when Black Dove mentioned it in a previous live stream about some woman knowing about a third suspect, it wouldn't surprise me because, yeah, sure, Chase and Jim are kind of similar in terms of their background history, their criminal records, whether it be burglary, maybe some forms of violence, breaking certain rules, uh, not being controllable, unstable, reckless, not good to be around. So yeah, there's links there, but you know, you still got Don and you still got Roberts and maybe the odd other person who might have been mentioned or not known of yet because they too have been in contact with Dylan in some way, like Don working. But we'll see what happens you know, with time, because maybe a third one might be revealed or talked about. Maybe it could even tie in with the current police investigation, you know, with things being kind of quiet at the moment and, you know, secretive, is there a possibility that what they found ties to another suspect, but for legal reasons, because of the court and maybe some other stuff, the procedure, they can't reveal it yet. That's a possibility. Now, when the mother was responding to uh, the question about who the two main people, you know, the mother, yeah, she was agreeing that Jim was one of the main ones, but she also brought up Chase. Now, from what people have said, you know, it, it's a little bit muddled, but from what other people have said in the comment section at times, they've been saying that the mother doesn't believe it's Chase, even though she doesn't know really anything about Chase. That's what I've heard. The mother knows more about Jim, James Brenner, than Chase. So people were getting suspicious, saying, well, how can the mother be so sure Chase isn't one of 
the main suspects or responsible behind it, how would she know if she doesn't know who he is and what he's capable of, etc. And yet, you know, she uh, knows Jim more. I mean, I guess it depends how you look at it, you know. If you know more about Jim and you also know about his past history and how he acts and reacts to things, then yeah, you probably are more likely to blame him and say he's responsible. Um, at this moment in time, um, he is classified as one of the main uh, suspects, but hasn't been officially charged yet, I believe, with the outcome of Dylan. Um, but he has been charged as a felon because of owning firearms at the time of being a felon. You're not allowed to have firearms if you're under that. So that's why Jim is in custody at the moment. But Chase is as well. And this is where it gets confusing because people are saying... Uh, the mother doesn't think it's Chase and that Chase is innocent. But in that interview, the video, the way the mother was talking was um, Chase is in custody as well. And it was said that firearms were found in Chase's uh, trailer where he lives. So he had firearms as well, just like Jim. You see that gun pattern following, owning a collection of firearms. Now, I know... On a side note, people could say, so what? Does it really matter? You know, people in America have guns, etc., etc., for all kinds of different reasons. But it's not just that. It's to do with the pattern of the type of people that own those firearms in that area and the background they have. You know, with them having criminal records and they ha happen to have guns as well and one or two may have used them in a crime, such as uh, Chase during that, was it 10 hour standoff um, at some home in, um, is it Washington? I can't remember the, the actual state, but that happened previously in 2016. And then you got Jim as well, um, some attempted murder with a firearm at some point. So it's the people, it's not exactly the guns that are the problem, it's the people behind them. And I know we can, I know some people will get into much larger and deeper discussions with many other different things, et cetera, et cetera. But what you need to remember, you know, you can blame US for like certain laws and stuff but look at the UK we don't have uh, like we're strict with the gun laws oh no 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 it means shit you take away guns what happens knife crime there's a lot of knife crime in the UK so people like to criticize the US and take the piss out of the US but what about the UK the UK is a joke as well you can't just be selective and criticize the US because the UK with the knife crime is just as bad in a different style so Got to take that into mind. Now, linking back to the guns, the guns what uh, Chase had were found out to be stolen. So he stole them. That's another similarity with Jim because Jim stole that 22 caliber rifle to give to Don to hold onto. So you've got patterns of holding guns as well as stealing guns. So they seem to be obsessed with weapons, those people, Jim and Chase. So, it makes you think, well, what's the motive for Chase? Why does he need firearms like that? I mean, in 2016, he had grenades, he had a bulletproof vest. So, he's almost like, uh, what do you call it, warlike, ready, prepared for battle, very defensive. Why? What's caused him to be that way? Is there some issues going on or stuff that's happened in the past to cause him to be like that? Who knows? So... With him having items like that and also committing a crime to get them, he could be unstable, most likely. If he's in the presence of Dylan, who knows what it could lead to. So I understand why Chase is seen as a suspect and held in custody at the moment. Now, this is the key thing. From what's been said, Chase doesn't live in the area. He comes and goes from like Montello to some other place. I forgot the name of it some other state, I believe. So with being in a different state, moving around, you know, if he was the sort of person to, you know, kill more than one person and because of him not staying in one place, he's more of a commuter, commuter style crime, where you take one person out in one area, move to another state or another location further out and then, uh, you know, recommit again on somebody else and so on. That's what he'd be classified as. Um, in addition with this, the situation with Chase, 
from what was said in the interview, this is being treated as like a homicide case and tying it with Chase, some kind of conjunction of homicide. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Now from hearing that and that being tied to Chase, then in a way that seems to make Chase even more of a key suspect, right? If it's treated as a homicide case, it seems like things have developed. And because we know Chase has access to firearms and he was holding some, maybe that's the, um, that, that's the use of murder, the weapon he used to take Dylan out. Maybe the police in a recent time found a bullet casing, some kind of ammunition, the gun itself, fingerprints, which could tie to Chase, but they're not really talking about it much at the moment. So if that's the case, if Chase is linked with homicide and that's linked to Dylan, then what about Jim? What happens to Jim? Is Jim still involved in some way? Did Jim come across Chase at the time when it happened? And Jim was like, oh, well, revenge. It doesn't bother me. Um, you know, do what you need to do. Or did Jim join in as well? That's the thing. Now, with Jim and Chase, do they know each other? I can't remember if I did a direct video or not, but they do know Dylan individually. I don't think they know each other. It would kind of make sense because Chase, if he's just coming and going out of town from state to state, he probably wouldn't have stumbled across Jim. But someone like Don, who lives on the land or like five miles away, would know more about Jim and each other. So that would make sense there. But as said, at this moment in time, no official charges have like gone underway. So they're still in custody at the moment. It'll be interesting to see if any get released or if any new people come in to custody as well and questioning, we'll see how things uh, go. Now, moving on to one of the next questions, the interviewer said to um, Candice, Dylan's mother, about what about the farmland, the way it looks visually? Dylan, why, why would Dylan be a farmer on that land? Can you even farm? Because it doesn't look like there's any crops grown. And that's true. Now, from what the mother said, she didn't really answer specifically what it's being used for. She went on about the backstory saying, you know, the way things were with the virus and the outbreak at the time, it meant schools were closed. Well, yeah, that's true. There might have been a bit of homeschooling, but they were officially closed, the actual buildings and places. So Candy said it was the perfect time for Dylan to, you know, begin farming and getting on with stuff, progressing quicker, I guess. And, you know, it's something he's always wanted to do. Now, um, the mother, um, the question was directed to the mother saying, you know, there's been talks and suspicion that you dropped him off in the desert and left him out there. Now, her response was, well, well it's, it's what Dylan always wanted to do, but it's also because of the land. He wasn't able to buy land elsewhere, 10,000, 15,000 acres. Now, I don't know what that exactly means. Like, I don't know if the mother is referring to uh, money issues. It cost more for more land elsewhere in other states, I was saying East Idaho and some other places, it cost more. So that's why um, Dylan was able to go to Luce in Utah because it was cheaper, the land. It didn't cost as much. If she didn't mean that, then maybe it's just simply to do with space. Dylan wanted a lot of acreage and it wasn't available in that size elsewhere, but it was in Luce. Either way, okay. In terms of the farmland itself, they're saying something like 20, was it like 24 years ago when um, it was last used as a farm, like the land itself. So because it's not been used since, it's kind of gone to waste. People have not known how to use it since. But uh, with Dylan moving onto that land, he's uh, started um, progressing and uh, making it more of a farm and uh, producing the resources and stuff like that. Now the question is, what exactly, what is it used for? The mother in the interview doesn't exactly say what. What's been grown or what's been produced, what's been exported and distributed, none of that is mentioned from what I heard of. Now, there's claims in the past that the land of Dylan Bohr, unknown to him at the time, was there was a lot of salt present. Now, I don't know if that's exactly true, but 
in my last map analysis video I did of um, Montello, there were certain areas where it was like really dry and white looking and people were referring to that as, you know, salt deposits and just like salt present. Now, that looks similar to Dylan's farmland, maybe not all of it, but some of it at least, very dry, kind of white. And if you remember, not far away from the airport, that little private one near Dylan's farmland, uh, North East, West, there is, um, I, don't, I think there's like a mine or like a mine shaft and then a bit further uh, down, there was a digger, a yellow one, and then further down was that blue container. And that area of mining, it looked like salt, maybe it's like a salt mine or just a ground when you dig, there's lots of salt. So, I, you know, you can export that, right, as resources, materials, and make money that way. Can, um, can you farm for salt? You can mine for it, I guess, but can you farm it? Or was there something else being used? Because, as I said, the mother doesn't say um, what. She doesn't, uh, all she said was, no, it's not used for crops, but Dylan found a way to make things work. But how, what, we don't know. Maybe you know. You can leave a comment down below whether you're, you've you been in the area or someone's told you about the area. What's the farmland exactly used for? You know what I'm saying? I know we saw the odd TikTok video where he was on the land. He had that sprinkler system, um, irrigation, whatever. And then the actual ground itself had those little gullies going all the way down and flooded with water. But... There were certain areas, whether it be on Google Maps or some other footage where people were saying it's 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 been abandoned, it's not been used since or since that TikTok video or something in 2021. So what's really going on? Other people are saying about the land, there was like brownish patches in certain areas. So it's like, what's that used for? I don't know personally. I can't imagine it being clay, but it looks like the colour clay. Um, but then again... In my last map analysis video, there was other areas which you saw yourself. Is there was mounds and um, lighter coloured ground which looked similar. So who knows what that is. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it would be useful to know what the land is used for because is it for legal or illegal reasons? Is there something secretive going on or not? When there's not much clarity, especially in an interview that is about clarity, and clearing up suspicion it's led to a little bit more suspicion in other areas that's that's um that's the way i say it at least so further on into the interview the interviewer brings up the question about dylan being in a gay relationship and how the general public are a bit suspicious of it and wondering if that has anything to do with the outcome of dylan and from what the mother said she did reply saying there's no ground to back it up that dylan is gay and from what she knows of, not a single person who knows Dylan that wouldn't laugh at that theory. You know, thinking, oh, it's ridiculous. How could you think of that? Now, okay, fair enough. Uh, some people say one thing, other people say the other. And it's just trying to understand who's right and who's wrong. The people that know someone could be more likely to be right. Okay, I understand that. But... You know, the, the people like the, the ones talking online or, you know, people that claim to be friends of Dylan, they said a different story saying that Dylan was in some kind of relationship with somebody and it might have led to conflict, whether it be with the family or the residents of Montello and the church and something could have happened there or Dylan had to get away from the place because of being threatened uh, to just get away from it and start again. And... You know, I have seen people bring it up about the gay theory. Um, it's also been the private investigators, the odd one or so that reached out, well, not reached out, but maybe family reached out and then the private investigator or investigators came in and then came up with that theory, that idea and concept. And then those guys, those people who came up with that was fired on the spot because the parents didn't agree with it. Now... Hearing from what the mother said about there's no ground to back up Dylan being gay and she would know. Um, I guess it kind of makes sense to why she would dismiss those theories back then from what we didn't know about the time, uh, officially, and getting rid of the investigators because 
she should know better, right? I mean, I might be wrong saying that, but yeah, that's just the way it seems. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've got these private investigators, you've got, I guess, YouTubers or maybe some other people out there who will come out with this idea, come up with this, say this and say that. Why? Because they're trying to help. And, you know, if not that, they're just trying to establish some kind of groundwork, some kind of foundations to know where you stand in the situation uh, with the person, what they're all about, and then you can work from there. Because if you haven't got anything, it's like, it's like, what do you do? And t times have been like that with the Kenny Beach case in the past. With that being more of an open case and not directly factual, it's open to interpretation because it's an open-ended mystery and it's not been solved. So, you know, all kinds of ideas and theories came out about that and were welcomed. But maybe in a case like this where it is a bit more factual, you want to try and stick on the line, um, you're probably more likely to be dismissed when you come out with a slightly wild or off the road type theory but then again depending who it is originally coming out with information whether it be the family or it could be the odd friend or somebody else out there investigator and the information keeps switching and changing then it starts becoming a little bit confusing and then you might well say well if that's not for definite and that's not directly factual then we might as well just come out with all kinds of theories and ideas so it's worth mentioning that now, in addition, the mother did say about how, like, at times in the past, the mother and, like, the family were desperate, so they did try reaching out to YouTubers, investigators, and then that kind of put a negative spin on uh, her son, and she feels like she's responsible in some way. I mean, um, it's interesting what they say, like, um, in a way, accepting responsibility, in a way. I mean, people could take that as a positive thing, and other people might say it's a negative. I don't know what to really make out of it. All I would say is, is it's natural for like the parents or family to reach out to different people, even if it is somewhat reckless at the time, because you know high state of emotions. You want to, you want success immediately in trying to track the son down or the daughter, whoever, for the best possible results and outcomes. So you'll basically do anything just like with that 100k uh, reward at the time giving it out because you know it might improve the chances of finding them alive and so on so you know some some form of reckless behavior is understandable it's sometimes inevitable just like with the reaction and response from the general public with certain stuff it's inevitable things just happen okay but yeah, at the end of the day, regarding the gay theory, who knows what it could be like. Maybe Dylan did have like a bit of a secret life going on. Um, I still want to know about the odd Dylan Round's friend who um, emerged in the comment section at one point saying, yeah, Dylan was abused, things went on, he told me about it and he was trying to get away. You know, where where's that person? Are they in the chat right now in the comment section? If they are or if someone is friends with Dylan or was in real life or online, could be on TikTok, Facebook, leave a comment, a reply right now or after and give feel free to give your thoughts about Dylan. What was his situation and maybe like his relationship with the odd person or so? How did things go? Is it true that he was in a gay relationship or is it false and the mother is correcting what she says okay so moving on the interview did um, link back to about the search you know the actual investigation undergoing at the moment and in addition to that the mother did reply Candice and say that everything needs to be preserved if general public come in now it's going to ruin stuff uh, you know evidence findings it won't be as genuine it, it's been spoiled but that's a little bit dodgy. This is a key point now, okay? It says everything needs to be preserved. If that's the case, then why did the mother or one of the family members get involved with approaching Dylan's red truck, smashing one of the windows to get into it? Why? That's not like preserving evidence, right? You know, you start inspecting the truck putting your hands on the windows or on the handles on, on the side of it, there could well be fingerprints on it. And if you've touched it now, you've ruined the evidence. There isn't any anymore, right? With certain stuff. 
There was other talks what people said. I don't know if it's exactly true. You can confirm um, below in the chat or so. Is that the mother took the vehicle afterwards. I don't know if like physically took it, drove it elsewhere. If that's the case, then yeah, that could ruin evidence as well. You got your hands on the steering wheel, a critical part where people would normally touch, especially when driving. The gear stick as well and the clutch. So if you start touching all that, it's going to be ruined. The trailer itself, I did hear Jay Silverheels mention it, so I'm not sure if it's exactly true. But the mother, maybe a family member, was searching around in the trailer looking for stuff, looking for clues. Now, in a way, linking back to that reckless behaviour, it makes sense. At the time, heat of the moment, you don't know the exact outcome, you just presume they've gone missing. You don't always think the worst immediately. Might be different with Dylan's mother. If that's the case, then she should know better, but we'll get into that very shortly, okay? So you've got reckless behaviour, you're doing anything and everything to find clues um, to try and track Dylan down because it's not normal this. So you might act abnormal too because you're not used to this sort of thing going on. So you're not thinking um, and you're acting out and picking up stuff, moving things around when in actual fact it could well be a crime scene but you're not aware of it at the time. If it is a crime scene, the most likely there is evidence and you know, it needs to be left as it is. So it's a bit hypocritical, the mother saying things need to be preserved. Everybody, general public, get out here, you're going to ruin it. Didn't you ruin it yourself? Now, maybe that's not directly or not exactly the case, because if police have found something in recent time, then it, it might be a success. But by the mother saying um, you could be responsible for ruining the case, said two people searching, and yet she did move things and touch things herself, then that's a bit hypocritical, right? And from what the mother said towards um, the start of when it happened, they were thinking the worst, like he might have been killed or, you know, taken away. Well, if that's the case, and this was like round about the last known location you heard or saw of him um, with like the phone ping on the land, but also the boots being found near the, the shop, if you want to call it that, or the barn, whichever one, then you should know better not to touch stuff if you know or feel there's a crime and yet kind of went against it. So that's a little bit odd, right? So linking on to that original idea of thinking worst case scenario, the mother, the father as well, what was then said in the interview, Candy said, uh, because it's being treated as a homicide case, it's been a relief. That's what she said in her own words. Now, some people might misinterpret that and think, well, first of all, why are you somewhat calm? And now why are you saying it's a relief? You should be crying. It should, it's a bad thing to know that it's a homicide because now you know that he's most likely dead. So why are you not crying? That's how some people might interpret it. Obviously, if the mother believed he was dead from the start, then maybe with time things sunk in. Um, and that level of, of acceptance, you know. Sometimes one of those things where someone goes missing and it's the unknown which is the worst feeling because you don't know if they're alive or dead and you'd rather know one or the other. Um, obviously one uh, outcome is not good at all, the other one is good, but it just gets rid of that mystery because um, you don't want to get your hopes up thinking the person's alive and then at a later, longer point to find out the dead. You know, it's like with a completely different situation, like it's better to be hated than to be supposedly liked over a long period of time and then to find out that people don't like you. If you know from the beginning, it's less damaging in the long term. So maybe that's the case with uh, Candice and the father. So that, that's the way they were thinking. And with now knowing the likely outcome would have been a homicide, likely a death. Uh, they're just upset that Dylan is gone now. You know what I'm saying? Um, and they said that the new Dylan wouldn't have been responsible for his own death because he liked what he did. He was passionate about farming. So I guess it's kind of like peace of mind knowing that Dylan, aside from uh, that exact moment of the homicide, he was happy, he was doing what he likes doing, 
and you know he was calm he was a sound mind he didn't like commit suicide or anything like that from the looks of it so can i i can kind of understand that but then again towards the end of the interview they were talking about some kind of in memory of dylan whether it be a get together or planting seeds you know to do with um crops growing plants and stuff something dylan would do or uh, something a farmer would do on uh, farmland so it's like in memory of him but then the way the mother was wording it was you know uh, she was kind of like smiling at the same time in like a, I guess a hopeful way saying you know um, he should be back by his 20th birthday you know that was I think that was one of the main reasons why the whole interview was underway because it's like coming up to him becoming 20 turning 20 so she um the way it was worded in the interview was when the seeds are planted and we do it in memory of Dylan, hopefully he returns back. Now, isn't that a contradiction to what was said earlier? There's two lots of contradictions there. One contradiction is from the, you know, from the start of when Dylan went missing, Candy's the family believed he was most likely dead or something really bad happened. Okay, they thought the worst early on, but now suddenly the, the, um, they feel that he might return back. Well, if you're under the impression that you think somebody is dead at the start and you upset that, you know, mentally, then why are you now suddenly saying, oh, I hope he returns back? Is that normal or could it be some kind of delayed denial defense mechanism within, you know, accepting it then, but it changes with time? That could be the case because... Um, it doesn't always have to be to do with death, it could be something else. It could be being rejected by somebody. You like someone, they say no, or they don't give a clear answer, and you say, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay, it's okay. And then with time, it might build, and then suddenly you become kind of delusional and think, oh, they do like me, or they should like me, and then it gets a bit dodgy and messy, right? So that's one way of looking at it. The second contradiction is within the interview itself because just a bit earlier on in the interview she brought up that it's being treated as a homicide case and normally homicide equals death unless it's an, an attempted homicide which wasn't successful but that it wasn't worded that way so if she's saying that from her own words where it's a homicide case she's been told that then why within a few sentences after she then starts talking about um we hope he comes back I just don't quite understand that. It's a little bit confusing. Now, aside from that, was there really anything else mentioned? Well, the interviewer brought up like a like a rough question to do with, so what do you think yeah, as the mother, like with the people online, the YouTubers and investigators, the theories they've come out with, the suspicions, the links tied to you as a person and Dylan's outcome? And, you know, the way she reacted, we, we can do a body language one in the next video okay i've got that covered but the way she was going at it was it's a bit ridiculous seems to be some kind of witch hunt aimed towards her but at the same time she's okay with it she's okay with herself if it's done in in such a way that it's to try and find the truth or find something to solve the case even though she knows the situation better than other people i think that's like how it was worded now Okay, some people might treat it as a witch hunt, okay? Look, we're seeing crossovers, we're seeing patterns, links, not just, uh, you know, with uh, the Kenny Beach case. You know, you can argue certain people, there was witch hunts aimed towards them um, because of suspicion, lack of clarity, the way people were acting, the behaviour, because there, there was a lot of behavioural changes within the Kenny Beach case, such as certain family members and certain investigators, the way people sounded certain messages being a little bit cryptic the lot etc so that's why it was that way like the girlfriend of kenny one minute the girlfriend next minute not one minute some kind of expert with uh, mental health field um, homelessness and financial stuff successful with that but then kenny um you know not being helped in such a way and then um, the girlfriend suddenly saying oh it's a bit of a game you know i'll tell you if you're right or wrong if you get the, the clues correct if you get close enough and it's like well, what the, what the hell's going on? This is very dodgy, this. And then a witch hunt, a heavy focus, concentration on a singular person or group because of suspicion, lack of clarity. And I can understand why that was 
in the Dylan Rounds case up to a certain point because if family are quiet or they're not maybe showing the emotion other people might show. I know people react differently, but you know, people might see that as a bit suspicious and so on. Um, the bit about um, doing a witch hunt in the sense of it coming uh, to an outcome of finding information, solving something. It seems a little bit weird her saying that, but you know, it's one of those things where you make enough noise you get enough attention within a case you attract the right people with the right resources or information whether you're right or wrong in the coverage of what you're doing you're creating noise and keeping the case open and active you got something like the kenny veach case at a certain point that just died out completely and the only reason why it kept going was because you know certain people like artari like me, like Sean Hall, like uh, Scott Natal, Jeff Clark. That's the main reason to why it continued. And because it continued, people came in over time with certain information, such as one of the Veach family members who had important info to share, which did help make progression. And then you had other people, supposedly official search and rescue members over time. And then, you know, other people coming in and then investigating themselves and doing hikes with better material, equipment, providing different angles and perspectives, which helped reinforce certain points, debunk certain theories and suspicion. It has a knock-on effect. It's a catalyst. I could be seen, or other people could be seen as a catalyst to start something off, to ignite it, to speed it up. When it comes to the Dylan Rounds case, it's no different. Now, I know you could say the Dylan Rounds case is more ongoing and not a cold case. It's a slightly more factual and you've got to stick to the script and stuff like that. And you've got proper authorities who are actively, you know, going in and solving this and that. But if they're missing something, if there is a certain point, a bit of information or a link with another suspect criminal that hasn't been covered before or in much detail, but you've got some random nobody talking about it, reinforcing it with potential evidence and points and constantly going on about it it will create noise it might grab the correct attention from the correct people it could lead to some kind of questioning uh, putting into custody and maybe conviction you don't know so when you get external people getting involved at points and times it can be useful even though they might be criticized as outsiders they don't know what they're talking about they don't know exactly what's up but maybe they do sometimes these random people know a bit more than others, so it's always worth uh, looking out for. So that was the interview in general, analysed and my response to it. There could be a few more later other interviews. I don't know exactly what about. Um, there could be one like an update to do with like evidence found, the investigation. We'll see. You can leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think of the mother directly her responses and replies. Um, although I didn't say at the start of the video, I didn't use video footage from the interview because one, it is publicly available on YouTube for you to watch and refer back to, but primarily, in more importance, it's to do with copyright. I don't know about certain situations because things can get messy. With the Kenny Veach case, there was a fair bit of material, but because it being a cold case, it wasn't active, so you could retrieve certain information and cover bits and bobs and get away with it. So it was it was OK. But with an ongoing active case now with proper news channels being involved, I don't know if they might get a bit tight with the restrictions of usage. I know people can say, like, was it the fair act use, this and that. But still, I just don't trust it at times because I know how things can go, you know, but Maybe I provide you a few little screenshots and pictures in between just to be safe, okay? But I said, if you want to refer back to it, you can go on YouTube, East Idaho News, Dylan Rounds update, and you'll see the videos there, okay? So that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed the video. Leave your opinions down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.